22 September 2008. All items listed are for discussion only. No action can or will be taken. Uh, we have uh, Councilmember Souza uh, was ill this weekend. He is home, however, and recovering, and, uh, but he will not be here for the work session or the council meeting. We have two items on our work session. One is to provide feedback and input on the fiscal year 0708 CIP. And then uh, information related to the city's option for related to the historic Litchfield train depot. <coughs> so Ken Kennedy, you're up. CIP. Good, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Ken Kennedy, CIP Administrator for the City of Goodyear. Um, do we have a our PowerPoint up? Eddie, there we go. Oops. Uh, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide a uh, high-level status of CIP projects started and or completed last fiscal year, a uh, preview of CIP projects planned for this fiscal year, and to present and discuss the new CIP book, which I gave everybody a copy of. Um, spending means progress for the last, uh, last fiscal year, last few fiscal years. Uh, fiscal year 0506, we budgeted 131 million. We spent 27 million. 0607, we budgeted 165 million. We spent about 110. 0708, we budgeted 169 million. We spent about 111.5. And this year's budget is about 86.5, and that's counting carryovers. Uh, CIP projects completed or started in fiscal year 0708. Uh, Bullard projects, we had several Bullard projects. Uh, the I-10 interchange, which is complete. Uh, Van Buren to Yuma. Yuma to Lower Buckeye Parkway. And some of these I've had slides on, so I'll, I'll kind of talk a little more about them when I get to those. City Center Master Plan and Programming. Australia Mountain Ranch. Uh, Park Phase 1. Fire Station 185. Uh, improvement district phase one is done. Uh, water resource admin buildings complete. And wastewater treatment plant expansion is kind of an ongoing project. Um, this is a Bullard, Bullard interchange, and the construction you see is pretty much the I 10 widening project. Uh, Van Buren to Yuma on Bullard. Uh, that project will be completed December 9th. Uh, Stray Mountain Ranch Park Phase 1 is complete. Phase 2 is scheduled for, for next year. Uh, Fire Station 185, which is complete, Pebble Creek. Uh, wastewater Treatment Expansion. This is uh, the blower, blower building. And uh, that, and then there's some headworks and all part of the plant expansion. And now the capacity is uh, increased from 4 million gallons per day to 6 million gallons per day as part of that expansion that's now complete. Uh, CIP projects planned for 0809, Adam and Waterline, Bullard I-10 to Van Buren, city center design and or construction, depending on how far they get, uh, same with the library, and wastewater treatment plant expansion. Uh, this is Bullard I-10 to Van Buren. This is a cost share pro project with EJM, and we'll have uh, three northbound lanes and two southbound lanes, and uh, that project's due to be completed in January. Um, let's see here. CIP program progress for the past year. Uh, the implementation of the CIP ACE software, which is a database program that we implemented, and the creation of the CIP book, which I've mentioned that I've given everybody a copy of. Um, 0809, we're going to do the final integration between the city's HDE financial software program and the CIP ACE, so we can do some real, real good reports at that point. Um, it's, it's been a team effort for everybody with project managers, uh, budget. Uh, budget's been a big help, especially in the, the CIP book that we produce. Barb Huntinger, Kathy Sheff, Tracy DeSoma. So a whole lot of people helped a whole lot. So. 
Um, and with that, uh, maybe we can take a, just a quick look at the book. We can kind of walk through it. This is the first time we've had a CIP book, so. First, second page is kind of a program summary, and then it talks about the capital improvement program, five-year capital program, and it talks about revenue sources, expenditures, different types of expenditures, again, funding sources. Um, then if you turn to the tab where it says adopted five-year plan, I put the summary five-year plan in, the one that was adopted in, in June. So that's just kind of a high level, doesn't give you much funding sources or much information other than budgets and fiscal years and types of projects. Um, but if you'll turn to like the streets tabs, Second page shows you, it's GIS, uh, which did a real nice map. It shows you locations of the different projects, project numbers. If you go a little farther, then it'll give you uh, program sources and uses reports, which is just a compilation of all the projects. And then a couple pages farther, it shows you per project. So if you want to look at a project, how it's funded, when it's funded, funding sources, it has all that information. So that kind of gives you just a general general overview. And then in the appendix at the end, there's just some different types of reports that our uh, software program provides. And with that, I went through it fairly quickly. Do um, we have any questions? Or I know it's a lot of information. I just kind of <laughs> went through it very fast. So. Questions or comments? Want to take a bite a little bit? I, I know, and I, I, it's a big, big book, but uh, well, hopefully it'll give you a lot of information. And then, if you want to drill down on projects, you can go see funding sources, when it's bond money, how it's divided up, how much over the five years. So. Well, I'd say at a glance, it looks very helpful. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Organized, very organized. Yeah. Thank you. I have one specific question, Ken, if I may, on the. Uh, <clears throat> Water resources CIP with the uh, the new things that are coming about with the uh, mall and uh, the um, situation with Lipsco. Are we okay with what we have budgeted for in the CIP for the water resources department? The no. bringing in the water from Adamant and all this. That's really not my area. Usually that doesn't stop me from talking, but maybe Sean could uh, speak to that. <coughs> we've, we've had some major changes, or at least other concerns that have come up. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Cavalier, um, in response to your question, are, are you concerned regarding the, the uh, is the capital yeah, funding sufficient? Yeah, is there enough sufficient? capital funds in there to do what you need to have done? For the future, yes. The immediate future. What, what we've been able to do is we've been able to defer and, and, and stretch out, in some regards, some of the projects that we're doing due to a decrease or a slowing growth rate. We're continuing to grow as a city, but it's at a much slower rate than what was originally anticipated. So, it's, we've been able to defer or expand the time that it takes us to complete some of our projects. But overall, we're in good shape. All right, good. Thank you. So, why don't you hear? It's the right answer. <laughs> Yes, Vice Mayor. So on the on the funding sources for the projects, if it's a geo bond, we're going to see geo bond as a line item, not yes. general fund, right? Right. It'll say geo bond or it'll say general fund, depending on the fund source. Clarify for me. General fund would be sales tax revenue. Yes. At all. It's right. Property tax right. That revenue. Would, yes. Okay. Our construction sales tax or general fund. Okay, Councilmember Lord. It's a sidebar, but seeing uh, all the activity we're having with crime lately. Um, I, I would certainly hope that the advantage of having this five years, we can make some adjustment between these times because we may have to be doing that with our police department. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Thank you.
Okay, we'll now go to the uh, train depot, the historic depot, and Matt Hemp's map up. Should be a PowerPoint coming up in a second. Oh, it's coming up. Did you get a message about our 12%? The no. Indian, Indian Gaming Club? Yeah. No, I didn't. I got one, but I can't make it large enough to read. <laughs> so, Romina, you have it, right? <laughs> we may have gotten the award. No kidding. That'd be great news. Yeah. No, I can't make it bigger. Oh. It's not my eyes. I got my glasses. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd offer. <laughs> no, I. Tony's a smart Alec. No, I wasn't being smart. I was. No, I. I, I, I no, no, no. I appreciate that. Here you go. No, I probably now you're gonna. No, maybe you know how to do this. Probably not. The PowerPoint button. There it is. Oh, yeah. There. Don't worry, Rory. Keep going. Yeah, Matt. Let's don't wait for this. <laughs> My name is Matt Hansen. I'm a management assistant in the city manager's office. Mayor and members of council, I'm here tonight to talk about the old Litchfield train depot. Um, quickly, I'm going to run through a little bit of background information, which many of you have sat on the council for a while could probably give me the background information on the train depot. Um, talk a little bit about a current opportunity that's out there for the city, um, some potential options, and then a, a draft of a plan that I'd uh, look for your feedback and comments on. For those of you who have ever walked upstairs in City Hall, this is a picture that's been hanging on our wall for years and years. This is the train depot as it looked in the 40s and 50s. Um, for those of you that don't know the story about the train depot, it was built so executives from Goodyear and Akron, Ohio could take the train, get off on Litchfield Road, follow the palm trees and the citrus to Paul Litchfield's house and ultimately the wigwam. Um, there really is a sense, a defining sense of uh, what Goodyear Litchfield is all about based on this train depot and how it relates to the other uh, uh, buildings and items in our community. A little bit of background information. Uh, staff originally was authorized on October 17, 1995 to pursue acquisition of the train depot. Um, it was intended to be part of the city's 58th anniversary celebration in November of 1996. Um, that didn't happen for various reasons, uh, but the city continued to pursue the train depot, hired a consultant in 2001 to do a general assessment of the building. Um, in 2002, my predecessor, Linda Snitacore, and the Public Works Department applied for a transfer hand, transportation enhancement grant was successful in receiving $150,000, which at the time the city was going to use to acquire the train depot. Um, that particular grant application had to do with um, uh, placing the, the depot on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, for various reasons that I'll get into in a minute, um, the city decided that we couldn't use the grant, and the grant was actually returned, and staff was instructed to end pursuance of the depot in April of 2003. A little bit of information about what happened in 2003 and, and why we didn't utilize the grant and why we never uh, secured the train depot. At that time, the purchase price of the train depot was $80,000 plus. I put the plus there because at the time, we were first negotiating with an estate trying to buy the train depot. And then ultimately, we were um, negotiating with a married couple who was going through a divorce. And it seemed like every day that the price went from $80,000 to $100,000 to $120,000. And rightly so, that scared away um, uh, elected officials at the time. Um, another big um, issue at that time and a, a real cost driver was the fact that the city did not have a parcel of land uh, to place the train depot on. Um, much of the cost estimates at the time had the city uh, not only spending $80,000 to acquire the depot, uh, moving it, renovating it, but also coming up with $350,000 to buy a parcel of land that the train depot would sit on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the grant also required National Register of Historic Places um, designation or nomination. Uh, the National Register is very specific about what you need to do to get a structure put on the register. One of the specific requirements is that the building is either used for or could be used for its original intended purpose, which means the city would have had to have acquired a piece of property somewhere in the neighborhood of the railroad tracks in MC85. and we could use it for other purposes, but it would have to you know, be roughly restored to how it looked and, and 
how it functioned when it was an operating uh, train station. There were also very short lead times, both for the, the birthday celebration, as you saw on the previous slide, there was about a year from acquire the train depot to have something in place for the birthday celebration, and then also the terms of the grants had a, specific, you know, a, a two or three year clock that was running and made it difficult for the city to, uh, to act on the project. Um, another um, situation that occurred then was the city was uh, operating alone. The city was in a place where we were accepting all the burden to buy, move, renovate, and operate the facility. And many of the cost estimates at the time put it at a million, a million two for that entire uh, package of work. Why we were talking about it today. Um, uh, the owner's current plans to sell the depot have fallen through um, uh, for various reasons. Uh, the, the ownership group out of California is now looking to sell the parcel of property. They believe very strongly that they'll be able to move the parcel more quickly if the train depot is not there. So they're looking for outside parties to buy it and move it, salvage it, demolish it, you name it. All the options are on the table. Um, as I mentioned er earlier, um, in 2003, we were looking at $80,000 to acquire the depot. The price estimate now is $5,000, plus the cost needed to renovate the site. There's a block foundation and some other work. Um, the owners are really just looking to restore their piece of property, you know, um, as much as possible so that another uh, buyer or investor will step in and want to build houses or do something else with the property. And they really see this train depot as being a, a prohibitive factor from that happening. Um, it would cost us 31000 to move the structure. Um, uh, this is a really good estimate based on um, all the technical difficulties as um, taking it over um, drainage ditches, moving utility lines, raising stop lights, um, you name it. Um, additional funds would be needed to store and secure and move the structure a second time. Um, timing is complementary of the Arizona Centennial, which is happening in February of 2012, and also the establishment of the Goodyear Centennial Commission. And ironically enough, in my research, I found out that the train depot was open in November of 1928, making November of this year the 80th birthday of this uh, particular building. <coughs> Options. You know, what I'm here to discuss with you today is a short-term plan about what the city would need to do over the next two to three months to secure the building uh, and potentially um, prevent it from being demolished or salvaged or stripped or any other things that might happen to it. Um, in general terms, um, the use would be as a historical attraction, a community focal point, and a centerpiece as it promotes regional access for our community and surrounding areas. I, as I talked a little bit about the history before, I really see this structure as tying, you know, the region's history together. You know, how Litchfield Road related to the wigwam, the Paul Litchfield House, you know, the reason we still preserve the citrus trees and the palm trees down Litchfield Road, the train depot is really that missing element. As you'll see later in my plan, part of it is um, once we've preserved, saved the train depot, that we would then hand it over to the Goodyear Centennial Commission once it's seated to make some specific recommendations and options about uses. Um, just wanted to throw out some of the brainstorming activity that's happened, potential uses. This is about an 1,800 square foot building, um, and these are some of the ideas that have come out so far. Um, I'm sure once the Centennial Commission gets a hold of it and the public at large gets a hold of it, there'll be you know, hundreds of uses that we hadn't even considered. But in general, a veterans memorial, visitor center, uh, museum, either train museum, Goodyear history, you know, Sonoran Valley, Arizona culture, you name it, uh, space for model train clubs, uh, public art display space for uh, Goodyear artists to uh, display their own artwork so the public can come and see it, uh, school art groups to display their artwork, uh, senior meeting house as you see in several of the other communities in Maricopa County, a library annex such as a children's Rio reading room, um, a uh, recreational railroad, um, Anthem has one, Peoria has one, uh, Scottsdale has one, like McCormick Stillman Railroad Park, um, or even, you know, a commercial purpose like a coffee shop. Um, Matt? Yes. 
Yeah, this might be a good time to just say that these options, uh, part of these options came because we had a committee and we had some members from the public that were there that helped us put these options together. So it wasn't like we just did that in a little vacuum. Thank Absolutely. And, and like I said, you know, this isn't the options that down the road will be chosen from. There'll be, you know, if we decide to move in this, in this direction, there'll be lots of work with the Centennial Commission and bringing in, you know, additional members from the public uh, to come up with a you know, whole host of ideas of what we can do with the site. Location. Obviously, the owners are looking for something to happen in the next two to three months. So the city would have to be in a position of moving it to a temporary location. Um, I just want to highlight three item, three sites. We've actually looked at more like 20 to 25 possible sites of where the, the train depot could be located. Um, there are a couple limiting factors. One is that the train depot is about 19 feet tall, so it won't pass under the I-10. So sites north of I-10 are, for all intents and purposes, out unless we wanted to take it into Buckeye or into Avondale over I-10 and bring it back. Very cost prohibitive. The other thing is, is you know, based on the size of the structure, its age, um, the bridges across the Gila River are crowned both this way and this way. It'll take a significant amount of work to take it south of the Gila River and also the roads winding up into those neighborhoods just make it, you know, not really feasible. Certainly if that's the direction the city wanted to move in, it could be done. It'd just be cost prohibitive. So that being said, we also went to uh, look at sites that we owned or we had partnerships with. Um, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to go out and, and lease or purchase land for a temporary storage. The site that made the most sense, um, because the city currently owns it, we have a 24-hour presence there, and we really could you know, ensure that the property, the, the structure was secured, was the wastewater treatment uh, property, the dog park. Um, moving it there. It's on public land. We own it. We have a 24-hour presence. We'd be able to secure it um, and, you know, prevent it from having any vandalism. The airport uh, has also graciously accepted to uh, store it for us. Um, a great idea. My only concerns about the airport site is if they have, you know, an economic development project or something else that came along. Um, we have a great relationship with them right now, but in the future, if that relationship happened to go south or they needed us just for security or some other reasons to move the depot before we are ready to move it, we'd be in the position of having not only to move it twice, but possibly three or four times. And then City Hall parking lot, um, not a lot of space. We don't own the parking lot. We'd have to work out a lease agreement with the owner. So in, in our eyes, the, the site that really made the most sense would be the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, permanent, again, you know, once the Centennial Commission gets their hands on it, starts to determine some specific uses, this list might grow. Again, we looked at a, a large list of uh, possible uh, locations. The same limiting factors exist. Um, the site that made the most sense would be the, the northwest corner of the cen city center parcel, the passive park area um, up against the Wildflower Ranch community um, being used for a, you know, a, a complementary attraction to all the development that's going on in city center. Um, the other parcel of land, which is south of the I-10 and north of the river that the city owns and already has a public purpose, would be the dog park. Financing. Um, short term, to purchase, move, and secure the structure temporarily, the city would need roughly $45,000. Um, I'm not trying to sell you a, a bill of goods that I'm saying all this project is going to need is $45,000. Trust me, I know what the long-term expense of this project is, and I'll have a couple follow-up slides to talk to it. But just to do what needs to be done in the next two to three months to save the depot from being sold to another party, to be stripped, to be demolished, we're looking at $45,000 to purchase it, um, restore the property to the way it was before the depot was there, and to move it to a temporary location. Um, I was asked to um, recommend some uh, possible uses um, or sources of this money. Uh, the, the item or the, the source that makes the most sense uh, since we would be proposing to have this as a centennial project would be the money that was currently set aside for the Arizona Historical Advisory Commission, the AHAC and the Centennial. As you remember, this was roughly $47,000 that was uh, sent to the AHAC um, when they were asking all the local cities to contribute. Um, uh, 
things have changed with the AHAC money that they were trying to use uh, city funds to match to leverage state funds have been swept Goodyear was the only city the first and only city to contribute to the AHAC and that money is sitting there for our purposes when and if we have a centennial project to work on a um, couple other possible sources uh, money currently set aside for matching future grant opportunities certainly I see this as a project as we would submit multiple grant opportunities for using money from the match pot of funds now I can use this match against these current grants and then the last two items um, is money that would be next fiscal year but funds budgeted for the next cycle the community funding program or the event sponsorship seeing that this project would be um, in the community good giving something back to the public those potentially would be you know uh, relevant sources of money to uh, to dip into if need be financing long term um, again so much will depend on what the uh, the uh, Centennial Commission uh, recommends for where the, the train de be depot would be located and what use it would be used for. But roughly, we're looking at $250,000 to $350,000 um, to renovate this structure, to move it, put down a slab, and to renovate it. This structure is essentially the size of a large mobile home. Um, you know, we're talking 1,900 square feet. It's a one-story structure, so things like ADA and, and some of these other expenses um, will not be as significant as maybe they were with the, the house in Buckeye, as you saw, all that uh, media coverage of their project. Um, we factored things like sprinkling, um, putting a sprinkler system into the structure, as we know that would be a code requirement. So roughly, depending on the usage, it would be roughly two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Again, that's not what we're here to tonight to decide, but uh, financing options would include grants obviously uh, additional AHAC funds uh, that would come from other communities if we designate this a 2012 legacy project corporate donations citizen donations uh, in-kind efforts from community groups we have the universities now Franklin Pierce has sent students to our community to do public uh, projects um, having college kids on spring break in the train depot fixing plaster painting you know it's going to take that sort of effort to make this project uh, go forward um, commemorative bricks and other save the depot fundraising efforts and what I feel is the key difference between what happened in 2003 and, and what could happen today is that the city wouldn't be taking this on by ourselves for a project like this to be successful it's really going to take a third party partner um, so I would recommend establishing or identifying a third party organization to renovate and operate the facility for the public good if it was going to be a, a veterans memorial you know partner with fighter country partnership or you know the Air Force auxiliary or some other organization if it was going to be a museum three rivers historical society um, you know that's really how we're going to have the buy-in from the public and a project like this would be sustainable long term the train depot's current condition there have been a lot of rumors about this thing falling down you can see the Sun through it um, I want to you know put rest you know put some of these rumors uh, to bed um, historic preservation historic preservation is typically look at three things is the building watertight um, is the roof relatively watertight the train depot has a tile roof that is intact so the building is relatively watertight is the building standing square and plumb um, this building is absolutely standing square and plumb there have been barns in New England and cabins in the Rockies that are leaning at this angle that they still go in and preserve but here we have a building that's standing standing true like the day it was uh, first built and most importantly is the wood structure is not sitting on dirt um, we're fortunate that when this building was moved to its current location that it was put up on a cinder block crib wall so all the structural wood is actually sitting up on masonry and not on dirt even though inside the building there's a dirt floor and then the other thing historic preservation is usually look for is that the building was actively used if somebody's in there you know on a day in day out basis generally the buildings are in better repair until very recently this was actively used as horse stables and then as active storage so there's been a presence there's been some level of maintenance to the building over the years and now for the picture test <laughs> these are uh, current pictures of the train depot in the last month or so um, part of the reason why the owners want to move uh, the structure um, is this is an access route this is a um, 
a driveway that would be used to access lots further on on their parcel. Here's just another, a closer, and as you can see, the, you know, for the most part, the tile roof is in good shape. Obviously, there's some windows broken and some doors missing. The original Litchfield sign that people would have seen when they, uh, the train rode up. If I'm going too fast through some of these, just shout. Just another angle showing the ticket window in the front of the building. Here's the inside. Um, what you're seeing on the right, that wood structure, is not in original to the building. That's actually where the previous owner built out horse stables. And the house where the, the train depot sits in the past year or so has had a fire. And as they've started to clean out the fire damage from the house, they've been bagging it and loading stuff into the, the train depot. So you'll see a lot of windows and garbage bags and things, and they have absolutely nothing to do with the train depot. They have to do with the building, the house that's sitting closer to the frontage road. This is a, a look into what would, would have been the uh, Ticketmaster's office. Um, the train depot does have a restroom, which was used by the Ticketmaster. And it's hard to see on this picture, but stacked there through the doorway in the corner is some of the original crown moldings that wrapped the building. Um, when this uh, train depot was built, there was an expectation or an intent to impress the executives coming in from Akron, Ohio. So it was built to a higher standard than most train depots would have been built at the time. And actually the farm superintendent here at Goodyear Farms kicked in some extra money to the train company so that it could have some of these enhancements such as uh, uh, tin ceilings and crown moldings and some of the t uh, stucco treatments have no idea if this is original, um, but it's kind of cool. It's a uh, <laughs> wagon wheel chandelier is. hanging um, in what was the uh, Ticketmaster's office. This is the, the pile of garbage I was referencing, which has nothing to do with the train depot, but was pulled out of the house. As you'll see to the right, some of the original doors are still hanging on their tracks. And it, you know, at one point, it would have made a great place for horse barns. I mean, it's just a big open space, and he was able to... Uh, retrofit with stalls and it would have worked perfectly. We don't believe this sign was directly related uh, to the train depot, but it is on site. It would be part of us purchasing the city or us purchasing the train depot. Um, and it is currently a, you know, an operating uh, railroad crossing sign. So here's my draft plan. And again, this is not about five years down the road is not about three years down the road. That's going to take input from the Centennial Commission, input from mayor and council, the public at large. This is specifically what we would have to do to um, secure the building in the next two to three months and preserve it so it would even be an option for utilization, you know, three years down the road, five years down the road. Secure the depot as a centennial project for the city of Goodyear. Negotiate a, a formalized sales agreement with the current owners and bring that sales agreement back to the council at a future date. Uh, finalize the contract uh, with the movers. This is the same moving company that did the, the house in Buckeye. They have oodles and oodles of experience moving historic structures here in uh, Arizona. Temporarily move the depot to the wastewater treatment plant uh, to store it until such a time as a permanent location can be identified and prepped to accept the train depot. Uh, once seated, um, turn over the project to the Centennial Commission to then really brainstorm, uh, reach out to the public, and get some specific ideas, recommendations about what the train depot would be used for, and then use funds previously allocated uh, to the AHAC for these initial steps, which again is roughly $45,000. I just want to acknowledge a couple people, uh, Brenda Holland, Gary Gelzer, Wally Campbell, and Gloria King. Um, They've been a great source of uh, information about what's happened with the train depot previously, um, some putting in historical context, and really helping uh, you know city staff brainstorm. So I just want to thank them. And with that, um, open it up to questions and feedback. Well, why don't we start with Councilmember Holland? Well, Matt, I thought that was well done, and, and uh, thank you for bringing some of those details that I know that you had to go and and do some research on to give us more information here. This sounded really good. Uh, I guess I'm, 
having been on it initially and being a model train club person. Um, I'm, and, and not having that much in Goodyear that we can count on as being um, historic. I mean, even though from back east, this doesn't seem very historic. But when it's all you've got, and I, I know hopefully there will be a few more things that will come up that we'll be able to add uh, to our train depot as a historic um, preservation item. I look over at Paula when I say that because I think she's the stucky on the next project. But anyway, I thought it was well done, and I think you presented the information well, and it's all we know right now, and, and I, I think it's the right direction to go in. Thank you. Well, um, I've lived on the railroad all my life. My father was a railroader for 30, 38 years on the narrow gauge in Colorado, so uh, I'm familiar with trains and depots and love model trains and all that. I'd love to see it happen, but... Uh, also, I'd like to see that um, I'd like to see this happen with funds, donated funds, and uh, grants, and you know that direction. See us work something out if we if we did go to move it, because uh, the structure is in bad shape. And if worse came to worse, maybe it's better take those parts that are good, and just rebuild, take some good pictures of this, and then build the structure and uh, put those parts in windows, roof. Uh, doors, things that are there in the depot that are a part of it, um, and just rebuild it. Uh, I don't know because I'm not a structural engineer. So uh, anyway, these are it's worth looking into, and I like the idea of moving it down by the dog park. That would probably dog park. I think that's probably um, one of the best places for it. So um, at this point, uh, I'm I'm open. <coughs> Mayor, anything? No, I, I'm open to the idea. I mean, it's the most logical presentation we've had on this thing. And you know, I sat in the audience in April in 2003, and um, it was kind of a mockery. The million seven figure number that was being thrown around at the time was uh, was laughed at and yeah. ridiculous. And uh, but it would be a shame if this got torn down. I can I, I know somebody in town that has a printing press right now is making Save the Depot bumper stickers for you. So, um, in his garage. Yeah, in the garage somewhere. But uh, yeah, it would be a shame to uh, to to lose it. Um, one of those options I didn't necessarily see on there, but you know, on the transportation front, is maybe if for some reason we need a train depot in Goodyear for a commuter rail at some point, we'd put it next to the train itself so um, hopefully that's one of those things that you all discuss and, and think about but I think it's prudent to preserve it put it somewhere park it protect it keep it in the public domain and and uh, when the time comes put it down in an important place in Goodyear every place in Goodyear is important that's right. sorry that's right Frank said every place in Goodyear is important so <laughs> <laughs> well ironically before I walked in that door I was at the state uh, centennial um, meeting <laughs> and uh, you know there isn't as Brenda stated there isn't a lot of items that we have to um, really uh, preserve and, and uh, be historic um, we've got the money that we had given to how'd you say ASHAC or whatever the AHAC AHAC and um, that that's an idea uh, I, I want to make sure that even though this is a very valid um, item for the Centennial, we need to let the Centennial Commission decide that. And um, uh, but I can timing is right. There's so many grant opportunities through the Centennial that will be right. I mean, all of it kind of leads to it being right. And um, the only other thing that I can think of that is historic that most people may not know is that I recently found out that. The original Boy Scout clubhouse was uh, in Goodyear. Was the police, the, the old police headquarters that was a twin that's in Litchfield. That's the only other thing that I know that's that old. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, I'm open to hear all the things. And if if you could open your email, Mayor, that would have been great. To, <laughs> to I think Romino. It's all fuzzy. I tried zooming in on fuzzy. the letter. We'll get to it though after this. We need to adjourn the meeting before we do that, probably. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great presentation. And in my hometown of Lansing, Michigan, the train depot, the one that I went to 
over and over to take a train to Detroit to see my father is one of those historical um, elements of the city. And they have built uh, a combination museum and restaurant. And they've added two passenger cars, which are attached to the building, so that you can sit in a passenger car, if you'd like, instead of the main restaurant. Yeah. And it's always packed. Um, and it is always open to different groups to come in for luncheons, and it's kind of a priority to them if you have a club or something, and they will set those reservations aside. And the walls have all the historical pictures, um, and so, uh, you know, it's a positive. I, I'm going to give you reinforcement for this. <laughs> I do agree with we should try to work as many uh, donations and as many uh, companies that would help contribute, um, but I think it's a fine idea. And Brenda, thank you and the committee for all your work. Thank you. Okay, uh, a nice presentation there, Matt. Okay. The only thing I would just make sure everybody understands that 47000 could be returned to the general fund. Right. It's nice to use it for this, but it could be returned to. Okay, any comments on current above? We're going to get to that in our meeting. Well, I need to adjourn the meeting first, oh, okay. just to be careful. Uh, Current events, seeing none, meetings adjourned. Matt, is it good news or bad news? It's, it's wonderful news. I just don't know exactly what the news is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks to the very hard work of the mayor and Romina, our, our intergov, we were invited to apply this year to uh, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community for their 12% uh, Indian gaming money as part of operating uh, slot casinos, a certain percentage of that money needs to be returned to the public. And uh, we've been, the mayor's been invited to a, uh, a lunch recognizing them as a recipient and, and receiving the grant. Um, we submitted four projects, so I'm not exactly sure which project it is. Hopefully it's all four, but uh, I don't know.